On the Jordan Harbinger Show, you'll hear amazing stories from people that have lived them, from spies to CEOs, even an undercover agent who infiltrated the Gambino crime family. You're about to hear a preview of The Jordan Harbinger Show with Jack Garcia, who did just that. My career was 24 out of 26 years, was solely dedicated working on the cover. I walk in, I'm in the bar. Now there's a barmaid there, good looking young lady. She's serving me drink. Hey, what would you like? I usually, my drink was, give me a kettle, one martini, three olives, glass of water on the side. I finish the drink, the guys come in, I'm gonna go, go in my pocket, take out the big wad of money, Bam, I give her $100. If you're with the mob, I say, hey, Jordan, you're on record with us. That means we protect you. Nobody could shake you down. We could shake you down, but you're on record with us. For more on how Jack became so trusted in the highest levels of the Gambino organization, check out episode 392 of The Jordan Harbinger Show. This episode is brought to you by Progressive Insurance. Hey guys, whether you love true crime or comedy, celebrity interviews, news, or even motivational speakers, you call the shots on what's in your podcast queue, right? And guess what? Now you can call the shots on your auto insurance too. Enter the name your price tool from Progressive. The name your price tool puts you in charge of your auto insurance by working just the way it sounds. You tell Progressive how much you want to pay for car insurance. Then they'll show you a variety of coverages that fit within your budget, giving you options. Now that's something you'll want to press play on. It's easy to start a quote and you'll be able to choose the best option for you fast. It's just one of the many ways you can save the Progressive Insurance. Quote today at Progressive.com to try the Name Your Price tool for yourself and join the over 28 million drivers who trust Progressive. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. Price and coverage match limited by state law. I'm Brett. And I'm Alice. And we are the prosecutors. Today on the prosecutors, we share our theories. Is Leo guilty or has an innocent man spent 30 years in prison? and welcome to this episode of The Prosecutors. I'm Brett, and I'm joined, as always, by my top drawer co-host, Alex. Wow. Thanks, Brett. Better than Bargain Basement. There you go. That was <laughs> Lou. Lou coming in with the... Lou coming in with some compliments that we'll see if we can live up to it today because, I don't know, Brett, I, you know, before we started recording, I told you that when we have these kind of long episodes and I, and this is an important this is a really important case to me because of what you said starting out you know do we have the wrong guy in prison is there actual justice for the victim michelle here if it's the wrong person in prison and this is someone who is sitting in prison today not like we are you know we have no direct pipeline to anyone who could affect anything happening in this case right now but because sure we don't we alice sure we don't <laughs> sure we don't but i i think it's really important to get these things right and to be conscientious that a lot of people with a lot of things invested in this case these are their lives and we get to theorize and talk about a lot of things but in in no way is this easy for people whose lives have been affected by this case to listen to us kind of pontificate and i I recognize that so that's why i come to this with like anxiety because i carry with it a lot of weight even though we're not prosecuting the case we're not defending the case yeah, these episodes are really stressful. I think I understand now why so many podcasts don't actually give a theory. They just sort of tell the story because it's true. And we've talked about this before. We don't take lightly that this man's in prison for murder. And we don't take lightly that Michelle was murdered. And we don't take lightly the fact that her family has to watch this case be relitigated 30 years after they thought it was finished and after they thought their family member got justice. And I can't even imagine what that's like. And I think we forget about that sometimes in true crime. 
you know, I feel so horribly for Lacey Peterson's family that just every year it seems like there's some new thing that gets drug up where they have to relive the fact that Lacey's husband murdered her. And not only have to relive it, but listen to people doubt it for ridiculous reasons. So we totally get that. And so we're trying to approach these with as much seriousness as we can, because I think it's important to try and get to truth if you can. And today we are going to share our theories in this case. We've gone through most, well, I don't know going to say we've gone through all the evidence because there's always more than we talk about in the podcast. We couldn't, unless we wanted to spend the rest of our lives on any case. I don't care what it is. If you try and go through every single detail of any case, especially a murder case, you're going to be doing this for a year. So obviously there are things we left out. There's no question about that. And maybe some of those things are important. We always say that. And we always encourage you to go to the record. We'll put as many of the documents as we can up on our website. Encourage you to check them out. One piece of business before we get started. CrimeCon is coming up in May, and I don't want people to forget about it. If you're going to go, you can use our code, prosecutors, you get 10% off. We really want to see you. It's in Nashville, so hopefully everybody can make it. We had so much fun last time in Orlando, and it's great to be able to talk to you guys in person about these cases, and we hope we'll get to see you, and we hope that this is a case you guys want to discuss. So with that said, Alice, are you ready to dive into this? I am. I hope Good. we can do this justice. We'll see. Yes. We'll see what happens at the end of this episode. Well, let's just go straight into theories. So the first theory, which is one that I feel like a lot of people don't talk about because of a lot of what we've said, there are very defined suspects in this case, but it's possible that a stranger did this. It's possible that none of the people we have talked about is actually responsible for this murder. One thing that I think is sort of glossed over, Bond Valley talks about it some, and it came up actually a pretty good bit in the trial. This was actually a pretty violent area in that time, 1987 or so. There had been several violent murders of women in the area around the time of Michelle's murder. And in fact, one body had been dumped not far from where Michelle was found. And I think that person was never even identified. It was a Jane Doe. The story that you would have to imagine happening here is actually not that dissimilar from what you initially get from Jeremy Scott. Someone, you know, she's at a gas station late at night that's closed, deserted, in the rain, at a payphone. She's basically the perfect victim in a lot of ways. And if there was somebody in the area who wanted to kill somebody, she would be a target. Obviously, with Jeremy Scott, you have the fingerprints that we've talked about a lot, so you would just have to assume that the story he told is actually true. It's just, it wasn't Leo that did it, it was this stranger. Of course, the problem is, this is just a story that we made up. We talked to a school last week, it was a lot of fun, we had a lot of, a lot of fun. Those kids, they knew that case at the back of their hand that we talked to them about. But at one point, somebody said something along the lines of, well, is it possible this thing happened? And we said, well, yeah, it's possible, but there's no evidence that it happened. So it could happen, but there's no reason for us to think it did. And I think with a stranger murder, you basically have that. Could it have happened? Sure. Is there literally any evidence it did? No. So... This is one that, while possible, I think we can basically move on from. One interesting thing to note about that is that up until a few years ago, especially during the time of this trial, the reason we go through all these theories, even if we think the evidence doesn't necessarily support it, is that up until the fingerprints were identified as Jeremy Scott's, this was the other theory, right? Jeremy Scott was the stranger. It's just now after the fingerprints were identified, we now can have a separate theory that's labeled Jeremy Scott as opposed to stranger theory. And so I think it's important to note that this in 1987 or when the trial happened in the 80s, it may seem like it was just fantastical out there. But if you didn't seriously think about this theory, you may have missed a whole potential avenue of investigation, especially if you were trying to defend, say, Leo in this case. So I don't think it's something to be dismissed out of hand. And to remember that the Jeremy Scott theory until a few years ago was the stranger theory, especially for him. What he's saying so far is that she was a stranger to him. Whether that's actually true or not, 
is is something we can discuss further. And that's so true, Alice. And you said this a few episodes ago that what happened in this case is the thing that people always talk about in every case, but never happens. In every case we talk about, there's always some theory that it was a random killer, a serial killer who just happened to murder this person. And there's never any evidence of it. And we always just sort of dismiss it. In this case, the theory of it was a random killer is suddenly a viable theory. It's just not a viable theory for us because we've identified the random killer at this point and we're going to talk about him later. Right, exactly. And one other note, when we started, you know, on, on the main feed, this we're just getting started on this series, even though those of you who are listening to us record live, you're much farther in the series than than kind of the, the rest of the population. And as soon as this series dropped, episode one, two, I had about three or four friends just from my life who had grown up in this very area in the 80s and 90s. And they hadn't heard of this case before because they were very young when this case happened. And they immediately wrote me. And like, I have about three or four different text messages from friends telling me how incredibly violent this area was for them growing up. And that this type of violence, unfortunately, was not out of the norm. So that's for the stranger theory. And Keeping an open mind on that, you know, we'll move on for now, but very important. I wish maybe someone would have thought about this a little bit more back in the 80s, and maybe we would have gotten a little bit further in terms of the theories we're going to explore today. Okay, now let's dive into some more theories that people really do think have legs. And one of these is that not Leo, but Leo's father did it. So let's think about this. After the murder, there was at least one time that Leo Jr. suggested that his own father might have killed Michelle. That's a pretty hefty allegation to allege against your own father. Those of you who think that Leo Jr. is guilty think, of course, he's going to point the finger at anyone but himself. Except that the person he's pointing a finger at, Leo Sr., really is kind of a shady character. And this is not just kind of a subjective view on him. I don't know him personally, but look at his record and what he's been convicted of. He was convicted of sexually assaulting a teenager in Rhode Island. And it's also my understanding that he's presently in prison in Idaho for a similar crime. Remember, Michelle, she was a teenager at the time of her death. They were only 17 when they got married. In less than a year, they hadn't even been married for one year. She was 18 when she was murdered. And Leo Sr. hasn't assaulted one teenager, but potentially more teenagers and even been found guilty in the court of law. You can imagine a scenario where Leo Sr., having his eyes on Michelle, decides that's his next target. Right? At this time, he hadn't been convicted of anything, but he has access to her. She's around all the time. He sees her all the time. And don't forget, he is the one who finds her body despite multi-day, many people searching. No one was able to find her, but he is the one who identifies her. We've talked about this. If you are the person to find a body, a dead body, you're going to jump to the top of any list of suspects, especially in this case where she was kind of covered up, not she was a little bit off the beaten path. It was a place that was visited by people who wanted to kind of be under the cover, whether to make out, do other things, do drugs. So it's a traveled path, but not a well-traveled path. And everyone had been looking for her, but it was Leo Sr. who found her. And you can't really discount right now. Remember that strange sighting by Alice Scott between 9 and 10 of Leo's truck at the trailer? So you wonder if she was just lying about that, but... It seems like that wasn't beyond her to lie. But what if she did see the truck? Because remember, Alice Scott seemed to have it absolutely out for Leo Jr. Leo Sr., why would she make up something about him? So had Leo Sr. actually come to see Michelle at the trailer? And had she maybe rebuked him somehow? Maybe he had come on to her, done something inappropriate, and maybe she rebuked him and even threatened to tell Leo Jr., and perhaps it was this that made Leo Sr. snap. So he follows her to the gas station and takes her from there after she stops to make her phone call to Leo Jr. And then the rest is what we now know happened. Yeah, and it actually solves a lot of your problems if it's Leo Sr. Remember, Aguero, who was a prosecutor in this case, if you believe Leo Jr., Assume for a second that Leo Jr. is innocent. Assume he's innocent. Assume everything he's told you is true. 
And Aguero really did visit him in prison and really thought it was his father. You can see why he would think that. Aguero wasn't stupid. He would have recognized the holes in his own case. He would have recognized the issue with the lack of blood, the lack of blood on Leo, the lack of blood in the trailer. He would have recognized some of Alice Scott's problems, that there were contradictions there. He thought Leo Sr. was a good suspect to the extent that he essentially offered Leo Jr. a deal, testify against your father and you'll be out of here. You know, we'll give you nothing, time served as an accessory after the fact, assuming that he helped his father deal with the issue. But imagine that Leo Jr. didn't. Imagine he's completely innocent. A couple things it solves. Number one, it does explain the Alice Scott siding. It might explain the LaFoon siding. If you imagine that really at some point Leo Sr. is out there, maybe after, imagine Leo goes back to the Andersons. You know, they've done all that searching. Leo goes back to the Andersons. Now it's time for Leo Sr. to take care of the body. And he enlists his wife. Remember, there was the LaFoon said there was a woman in the truck. Now, the LaFoons say they saw two men, but maybe they got that wrong or maybe they just misremembered. They see his father's truck and they see the orange car. That could have been as they were arriving on the scene to dump the body. Timing is tight, but it wouldn't necessarily not work out. I think Leo's father is a really good suspect in this case, especially if you've decided that Leo Jr. didn't do it. Jeremy Scott has all his issues. Ordinarily, I you know, sort of discount these alternative suspects like this, but I think in this case, Leo Sr. is not, he's just, he's not a bad suspect. There's not a lot of evidence directly connecting him to the murder other than the fact that the truck was seen at the scene of the dump and he found the body. And I just want to, I want to separate two things here, the finding of the body and what he said. I'm just telling you guys in 1987 in, in Lakeland, Florida, wherever they were, everybody there, if they found something that was lost, whether it was their keys or a dead body would say, thank the good Lord, Jesus, help me find these. That's what they would have said. It just, it just doesn't matter. There's no way that him saying that is incriminating. Him finding the body, though, is a separate issue. Just the finding of the body itself, that fact. He did find it. Now, look, he found it after a pretty good search. It's not like he went straight there. It's not like he went straight there that day. But he could have been using the search to cover up the fact that he eventually was going to find the body for whatever reason. So, you know, it's not strong evidence against him. But I think he's a good suspect. And the thing with, you know, we've been very focused on all the sightings, potential sightings by Alice Scott, LaFoons, all these other people for Leo Jr. And Leo Sr. is a little bit harder to peg because really, if he were a suspect, the people who would give him alibis are his own family members, right? It would be his wife and it would be his daughter. And he did say he was sick that night, or at least that's the story being told by his family. That's why if you think he's the suspect, is conveniently out sometimes, but then conveniently also at home, potentially supposed to be at home when maybe that's the time that he can slip away. But we don't kind of have, we don't have independent testimony as to where he was at different times the way we have for Leo Jr. We'll get into Leo Jr.'s timeline, but I think Leo Sr.'s timeline is a lot more loosey-goosey because we have always talked about how when your alibi is your family members, they obviously have an incentive to think the best of you or in a worst case scenario want to corroborate and help you if you are going to be in trouble with the law whether rightfully or wrongfully that's just how our brains work we always talk about how we don't want to depose or call to testify someone's mother right no matter what the mom doesn't know anything she's gonna lie through her teeth because she's like it's my baby boy gonna protect him so when do we have that problem here I'm not sure. It's just a lot harder. The evidence is just a lot harder to put together because we don't have external validators of, validators of time for Leo Sr. And then there's the added question of, if you think Leo Sr. did it, is there a world in which he could do it where Leo Jr. had absolutely no role? I'm not saying, I'm saying anytime, before the fact, during the fact, or after the fact for cover-up. They were together a lot that night. Every time that they weren't together, we have the daughter saying she heard her dad come in, go to sleep because he was sick, and she could remember the times. But other than the times that we have Leo Sr.'s daughter saying he's at home, Leo Jr. and Sr. are together. 
So is there enough there to actually suspect Leo Sr. while not suspecting Leo Jr.? Yeah, it's kind of the Adnan J. Wilds problem. They're together all the time, and they're two vehicles. You have to deal with the truck, and you have to deal with the car. So you really need two people. Somebody needs to be helping you to move two vehicles at once. I mean, it's not a huge area, but I don't think Leo Sr. is parking the orange car next to the canal and then hoofing it back to his house, picking up the truck and driving it back over. Somebody had to help him, which is why I wonder about the mother. And look, you just never know. I mean, you would think if your son was on trial for for murder and looking at the death penalty and you knew your husband did it, you'd throw your husband under the bus, right? And you'd think that, but people are complicated and you just never know. And I think given what we know about Leo Sr., it would not surprise me if that was also an abusive relationship and just a very complicated situation. So I don't know. It's, it's, if he did it, we'll never know. It'll just remain a mystery, but it is an intriguing thought. Yeah. I don't think it's, it's certainly not, He's certainly not a suspect I dismiss out of hand. But for me, it is not he's not a helpful suspect if you think Leo is innocent, because I think it is a difficult timeline to draw where Leo Jr. had no participation or no knowledge because of how many witnesses we have placing them together at key points in the timeline. Okay, so who's the next suspect? We're just hanging on a thread over here. Okay, we've kind of mentioned this with the stranger theory, except now we have a name to that stranger. What if Jeremy did it? So the Jeremy Scott timeline we laid it out last episode is pretty straightforward. Jeremy meets Michelle right after she makes the call at Sparky's, and he murders her shortly after. So there's no missing time for Michelle. There's no place she went for three hours. And this actually makes the most sense because there's no need to reconcile Leo's timeline with Alice Scott's all the timelines that she has and the number of ways it's changed. Now, basically, it would mean that Alice Scott probably embellished or confused what she saw. And the LaFoon's sudden recollection of what happened after talking to Aguero, who really needed testimony such as theirs, is interesting. But given how much time has passed, 15 months, it's really hard to credit the LaFoon's theory. And so that kind of wipes out, you know, the sighting of the truck and the Mazda together. And we know that while that's damaging to Leo, it's just not as solid of a testimony as you'd really like it to be in order to use it to ignore all of the evidence we have of Jeremy Scott's responsibility. And with that, I mean, this also truly almost never happens. The car was wiped down. It was wiped clean after whoever murdered Michelle. That's why there are no fingerprints for Michelle or Leo. But these four fingerprints that are in areas of the car, both the front and the back, trace back to none other than someone who's in the area during this time who actively was violent in this area, violent towards women, violent towards everyone, with very little trigger for his violence, as we've heard from some of his criminal history. He's been convicted of one murder, likely responsible for the cab driver murder, and has confessed to yet additional murders. Those confessions may be overbroad, but there may be some truth in what he's confessed to. And we have here that he is about this age, and we understand that he begins to tell details of that night that tie bits of the story together in a way that the prosecution story just can't do with respect to Leo. So could it be that this stranger, who's no longer a stranger to us because of these new databases that have traced these four fingerprints back to a Jeremy Scott, who was a known convicted murderer, violent towards people in general, violent towards women, just met up with Michelle on the wrong night. And he met her pretty soon after she made that call. And we know for a fact that no one saw her after she made that call. So it's not like she rolled around for three hours, hanging out with friends, going to parties, going grocery shopping, getting gas. All of that was done. Something likely happened to her very soon after she made that call because of the lack of sightings and the lack of anywhere that she went. And we know that what was found on her or near her or around her was basically what she had at the time. She didn't have time to go shopping. The change was on the floor that she had from her tips. We have Jeremy Scott saying, I took 10 bucks from her. That's all she had after she spent $3 on gas. We even have an accounting of how much money she made that night. They were not rich people. They carried the money they had on their body. And he gave us a tidbit that maybe was just a small detail. 
didn't really matter. It wasn't a planted detail, but it was a detail that fits perfectly in to why he would be the one to know how much money he took. And it happens to match up perfectly with how much she would have had on her body. So did Jeremy do it? And I just want you to imagine a world in which the police had done the most obvious thing. So they have a guy who they tried to convict for a murder and failed, who they believe did it. They absolutely think he's a murderer. You know, he he lit his bed on fire (laughs) while he was in the prison. Imagine when they got those fingerprints, they had ran them against known offenders in the area. Obviously, they don't have the databases like we do now. You know, computers existed, but they weren't like they are now. I think the database for fingerprints at the FBI was a massive card catalog system, which is kind of amazing, but that was the way it worked. But imagine they'd said, let's run the fingerprints against the people in the area. And they found that someone who lived a couple minutes away from Michelle and Leo, a few minutes away from the payphone where Michelle had made her last call, they found his fingerprints in the car. Imagine they did that a couple days after her body was found. And then they talk to his friends and they find out that the area where her body was dumped was an area he was known to frequent. And in fact, an area he was known to take women. And imagine they had discovered that he was violent with women. Imagine they had found out that he'd been accused of rape in the past. Even if these are things they couldn't have used in the trial because of various evidence rules. Is there any world in which they would not have charged him with this murder instead of Leo. Remember, it took them a couple years to make the case against Leo. This wasn't something they were able to do immediately. Let me say this this much. You know, we talk about prosecutorial misconduct or, you know, bad police investigations and whatnot. And we've talked about how police wanting to shape witnesses' testimony. I just want to throw this out there of something that could cut against the Jeremy did it or that the prosecution thought that Jeremy did it. They were clearly trying to get Leo Jr. to either say Leo Sr. did it or to potentially influence other witnesses' testimony, right? The LaFoons. There's some indication that they know a lot more information after they talk to Aguero, right? Alice Scott changing her story all left and right. Seems like every time that she talks to Aguero, she remembers something else that fits perfectly into the prosecution's story. So we're talking about a prosecution who may be trying to shape or put together witnesses to fit into their story versus the other way around. Here's the evidence, and then we're trying to understand the narrative from the evidence. In listening to Jeremy Scott speak on Bone Valley and seeing the history of his communications about his crimes and his confessions, whether they are real confessions or false confessions or confessions that are taken back, What seems clear to me about Jeremy Scott is that he is very impressionable with enough pressure, whether it's because he's been serving time or whatnot, but this was back in the day as well. We know this when he was convicted of the murder in the trailer. His testimony is more malleable than Leo Jr.'s is. And so if the prosecution wanted to twist someone's testimony, I would think it's a lot easier to do so for Jeremy Scott than to do so for Leo Jr. Now, this for me cuts against the possibility that if they were you were trying to frame or twist the evidence for one of them, I'd go for the easier one. I'd go for Jeremy Scott, who seems to change his story when he's when pressure's put on him, right? Like you you put him into a pressure cooker and he he kind of freaks out. He all of a sudden he writes to the judge and is like, I confessed to every murder in 1987, 1988 in Polk County. Like that's a little extreme, man. That's I don't think that's what you meant. We were just trying to get you to confess to this one murder. That's how he reacts in a friendly, stressful situation. And so I'm torn about this because Aguero knew Jeremy Scott. He prosecuted him. He is a known entity in this Cumbie Road area to Polk County to this prosecutor. Yet he wasn't pursued by this prosecutor. And if you're thinking this prosecutor is someone who wants to use tactics that are outside the realm of what I think is ethical, why didn't he go for seemingly the easier one to shape, which is Jeremy Scott? Is it because he really believed and had the better evidence that it was Leo Jr. and he wanted to make sure the right person was in jail for once? I think in 1987, he would have gone after Jeremy Scott. I think if he'd had the fingerprints in 1987, he would have gone after Jeremy Scott. He probably would have gotten him to confess. And maybe Bone Valley would have been about how Jeremy Scott's innocent. (laughs) Maybe maybe Jeremy Scott would have been the focus of everybody's efforts. And everybody's like, 
but her her husband was abusive and he was and there was a witness Alice Scott who said she saw him that night you, you mean can you imagine it would be pretty easy to build the Jeremy Scott was falsely convicted because he had all these intellectual deficiencies and yeah his fingerprints are there but it's because he stole the stereo I mean honestly it is just it is so easy to construct that that if Jeremy Scott had been convicted there would have been a famous podcast about how Jeremy Scott was innocent. But I think by the time Aguero, who you're right, prosecuted both of them, I think Aguero was so in on Leo at that point and so in on not being wrong that he just, he he couldn't admit the mistake. Assuming he thought it was a mistake. It was just too late. And Jeremy Scott, I mean, look, he is all over the place and he does change his story and he does confess and then take it back. There's all sorts of reasons to doubt him, particularly if you think you have a strong case against the person in prison. There's you see this with a lot of these innocence cases. You'll have somebody who's convicted and it's a really strong case. And then you have someone who comes along and makes a, a questionable confession. And then everybody who wants the person out is like, see, we know he's innocent because someone confessed and you hear that in this case. And I think you do have to be really careful with Jeremy's confession and you have to look at it under a, a real microscope. But I just think had Jeremy Scott actually been on their radar and they had those fingerprints in 1987, he would have been convicted for this crime, whether he did it or not. Okay. So that's Jeremy Scott. Let's talk about Leo. So did Leo do it? Well, if Leo did it, I think there is one thing that is almost certainly the case. The prosecution's theory is wrong. And that doesn't mean he didn't do it and doesn't mean he shouldn't have been convicted for it. We've talked about this before, but it did not go the way the prosecution thought it went. Leo did not murder Michelle in that trailer. There is just not enough blood there. There's basically none. There's certainly not the amount you would expect to see if someone was stabbed 20 something times and bled a half gallon of blood onto the floor. You don't clean that up and you wouldn't have had spots of blood with the luminol. You would have had masses of it. If Leo had killed Michelle and then left her body there for some period of time, as Alice Scott describes before coming to pick her up and put her in the back of the car, the blood would have been impossible to remove. It would have been everywhere. And you wouldn't have just seen it on the ground. You'd have seen it on the ceiling. You'd have seen it everywhere else that you would expect to see cast off. And what about the coroner statement that Michelle had been dumped in that canal shortly after the murder, just a few minutes after the murder. And then there's all that blood at the site. Tons of it. If you haven't seen the photographs, go to our website, look at them. That is where she was killed. It's absurd to me that the police said there's no signs that that was the kill location. That is silly. There's absolutely evidence that it was. But that doesn't mean it's impossible for Leo to have done it. It just means it's different than the state believes. I think if Leo did it, it was probably an accident, at least at first. So let's go through the story. The couple returns to the trailer. They engage in a fight, just like Alice Scott said, and just like they had done so many times before. But Leo doesn't stab Michelle. He strikes her, or he pushes her. And when he did, she either fell and hit something, or he hit her hard enough to knock her out. And in that moment, Leo thought she was dead. So he left her there for a minute to go talk to his father, because he's freaking out, and he doesn't know what to do. His father tells him, you've got to get rid of the body. You've got to dump the body. If they find her body in your trailer, you're going to prison. So Leo goes back to the trailer. He wraps Michelle's body in the bed sheets. He would later say they didn't have or something else that we just don't know about. He puts her body in the back of the car and drives to the dump site. Because it's a strike, there's not much blood in the trailer, if any. There's not much blood in the car, if any. His father isn't there yet, so he gets Michelle's body out of the car. But when he does, to his shock, he finds out she isn't dead. Maybe she even wakes up. Maybe she even starts to fight against him. And in his panic, he grabs the knife that he kept in his car, the knife that was testified to at trial, and he stabs her to death in a frenzy right there next to the vehicle. And that's why there's no blood in the inside of the car. That's why there's no blood 
in the passenger side or the driver's side or anywhere else. It's all right there where she was stabbed to death right next to the car. He starts to drag the body before his father arrives to help him finish the job. He then drives the car back out to the road and maybe parks it near his father's truck. They discuss what to do with the car, which is when the LaFoons drove by. Maybe the LaFoons timeline is a little bit off. They see the two of them there. Leo's father drops off the Mazda for Leo so that he and his mother could go around and begin to establish an alibi. I think that is the best story you can put together. The car is dropped off, and wouldn't you know it, Jeremy Scott, murderer and stereo stealer, just happens to come upon it and does exactly what he told the police. He steals the stereo and goes on. And it's a coincidence, but in real life, coincidences happen. But if you're listening, you've probably figured out there are some problems with this. It doesn't really fit the timeline. If Leo did it, there are likely many things we don't know and we'll never will know about exactly how all this went down that night. But there is one thing that we do know. There isn't actually any evidence in the record of any wound on Michelle's head or skull that indicates the kind of strike I've been talking about. The autopsy reads... Quote, there are no significant bruises to the head. There are no skull fractures. There are no subdural or epidural hemorrhages. So if this is how it went down, Leo hit Michelle just hard enough to knock her out, but not hard enough to leave any evidence of it. And then there's that timeline we just talked about. And before we dive into that timeline, though, I think there's a few things to note here. So... I agree that the murder, if Leo did it, would have had to have been by the canal. I don't think there was anything that involved blood at the trailer. Just he didn't have enough time. And the timeline, as Alice Scott would have seen it, would have left enough time for those stab wounds to have bled through the carpet into the subfloor. And, you know, a steam cleaner would not have been able to remove all traces of massive amounts of blood. And I think she'd be dead or her heart would still be pumping so much so that there would be blood, a massive amount of blood in the car, if that's the way he transported her. And if she would still have to be pumping enough blood to be able to leave that amount of blood next to the canal. So with all that said, I agree. I don't think any of the murder part would have happened at the trailer. And I think the only way it could have happened is exactly what you said, that she would have had to been knocked out at the trailer because you can imagine they got so violent there that she would fight all the way to the car. And if Alice Scott is truly sitting in her bathroom watching all this happen, you would think you'd see someone struggling because if Leo is that violent that night, you can imagine she's like, I'm not getting in the car with you. I don't know where we're going, but it's not going to be good wherever we're going. It's the middle of the night. So there would be a struggle and you would see the struggle in the trailer and certainly from a neighbor who is eyes pinned on this trailer, but she sees nothing of the sort. But here's the part I would really struggle with of believing the next part. So let's say she's knocked out, like you say, drive her to the canal, about to dump her body and she wakes up. This is the part where being an incredibly violent husband, I think, works in Leo Jr.'s favor. Because he's so violent to her, I think if she wakes up, it doesn't make sense that just because she woke up He would then decide to kill her then once he's had a lot of time to cool down from the rage in which what was happening earlier. You would think that he never had the intent at the trailer to kill her so that when he thought he killed her, he's in utter panic and the anger at her has dissipated to the point where it's no longer kind of seeing red killing. And so he's no longer there. You would think there's some level of relief. But if you think, oh, but she's going to tell on me because she can tell that I've wrapped her in a plastic sheet, let's say. She knows what I'm going to do. Except that she has put up with Leo's beating if you're going to believe the 20 witnesses or whatnot throughout trial, for their entire relationship. This night, honestly, is no different, sadly, for Michelle than any other night. So what about that night makes it so different that what he's found out, that Michelle finds out he's violent? No, Michelle has known he's violent all along. So what triggers him instead of relief, like, oh, my God, thank God you're not dead. And make up some story. You hit your head. You have no idea what's going on. We're out here. I I was trying to get you fresh air. There's ways to kind of lie it through or not lie. No one has stopped him from being incredibly violent to his wife for their entire relationship. No one stopped him before. What's different about this night? So that's the trouble for me that that would be the trigger. She'd wake up and then he'd violently stab her in the back and the front to the point where she's losing, you know, half a gallon of blood and then dump her. 
So while we're, while we're writing movie scripts here, let me let me write one that if this were a Hollywood story, the Hollywood story is Leo goes to his dad, tells him he's just hit Michelle and she's dead, and his dad says, "Go get the body, meet me, I will dump the body, you will go set up an alibi." And it's actually his dad who drives down to the canal. She wakes up and he murders her there, not Leo. And Leo actually doesn't find out until later that she's murdered that way. And you remember there was this moment in Bone Valley, which was kind of stunning to me, where Leo talks about how he didn't know how Michelle was murdered until right before her funeral. And that's when he found out that she was stabbed to death. That actually fits with this, my Hollywood story I just made up. Because he would have thought she, you know, died from being struck or from hitting her head. And then he finds out she's stabbed to death. And maybe that's when he realizes what really happens. And maybe that's when he tells the police, hey, have you looked into my dad? And it's just a really complicated situation. Not really any evidence of that. But I think if you want the story to work, you have to get her away from the trailer. She wasn't murdered in the trailer. She wasn't stabbed to death in the trailer. It just didn't happen. It had to have happened somewhere else, probably close to where she was dumped. So I think you have to concoct some sort of story like that one for it to work if it's Leo, especially given the timeline we're going to talk about. Right. So let's talk about the timeline if Leo did it. So at 9.45, Michelle, who's been home after work to let out the dog, the new puppy, and to do some tidying up, calls Leo at Buddy Anderson's from Sparky's to tell him she's coming to get him. Remember, they don't have a phone in the trailer. She has to drive down the road to Sparky's in order to make this call. And she had gotten off at 8.15, supposed to pick him at 8.30. So she's already about an hour and 15 minutes late in calling Leo. Now, Leo's already getting antsy because she is late in picking him up. So after getting this call at 9.45, Leo expects Michelle to come get him at any moment. But as the minutes tick by, he gets more and more angry when she doesn't show up. This is just like Michelle. She does this all the time. She just called me already late, and here she is late yet again. Where is Michelle? Leo doesn't know, and neither do we. To this day, we have no idea where she is. If Michelle was murdered by Leo, where Michelle went for those hours is a complete mystery and no witnesses that we know of. ExpressVPN is an app that lets you change your online location so you can control where you want Netflix to think you're located. They have over 100 different locations so you can gain access to thousands of new shows no matter where you live. This works with many other streaming services too. Disney+, Plus, Hulu, Max, BBC iPlayer, which is a free option normally only available in the UK. And I gotta tell you, I've used VPNs in this way a couple times. You guys might remember we watched movies with a bunch of people over Christmas holidays. We were trying to find movies. I was able to find any movie I wanted to see because I could always use the VPN. Not everybody in the movie watching group was able to do that. Another thing, I really enjoy the biathlon. It's one of my favorite sports. And whenever the Olympics come on, I want to watch the biathlon. People in Europe love the biathlon. People in the United States, not so much. But with a VPN, I can appear to be in Europe and then I get access to all of the sporting events I want to see. Here's the thing. It's super fast. I can stream anything in HD with no buffering and it works on any device. I can enjoy my shows from my phone, laptop, tablet, TV, you name it. It just works and it encrypts your data, which you guys know I really care about. ExpressVPN protects your privacy and security to keep you safe from hackers. So stop missing out on great TV and get thousands of new shows with ExpressVPN. We got them to give you guys three extra months free when you use our special link expressvpn.com slash prosecute that's e-x-p-r-e-s-s vpn.com slash prosecute to get three extra months completely free this show is sponsored by better help what's the first thing you'd do if you had an extra hour in your day maybe you'd go for a run maybe you're like me and you take a nap or maybe you'd read a book or hang out with friends we all spend our lives wishing we had more time, but we know it's not unlimited. Well, here's the thing. A lot of times, we're just not making ourselves and the things that matter to us a priority. And one way to figure out what matters to you is therapy. And that's where BetterHelp comes in. Therapy can help you find what matters to you so you can do more with the time you have. 
If you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist and switch therapists anytime for no additional charge. Guys, we all go through lots of things at different times, and there is absolutely nothing wrong with reaching out for some help, and BetterHelp is here for you. Learn to make time for what makes you happy with BetterHelp. Visit betterhelp.com slash prosecutors today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash prosecutors. I think people just kind of hand wave this away by saying, well, Michelle, she was flighty. And this is more than flighty. This is literally, I'm calling you to tell you I'm coming to pick you up right now. And I'm just going to go do something else for four hours. And we have no indication what that is. And that's weird. And the things that she was going to do, because the hour and a half that passed from the time she was supposed to call or pick up Leo to the time she actually calls him, she was doing something. They had a puppy who needed to be let out because he was still getting potty trained and the trailer was a mess and you just get off work. You imagine going home as a next step after getting off work. She had already done all that. She wasn't on her way to a party. She wasn't picking up Leo to go to a party. You know, she wasn't stopping to get food because, remember, on that call, Leo specifically said, we're hungry. Let Come pick me up. We'll all go get some food together. So she wasn't going to go get food. She wasn't going to a party. She'd already been home. There was really nowhere else to go. She didn't have a bunch of disposable income to go somewhere. This is late at night at this point, almost 10 o'clock. She's not going shopping. She doesn't really have the money to do so. And all the things you can imagine that draw her attention away have already happened. The dog tidying up. Go home after work. So where is she for these hours? This actually is a really big issue because we know at this time, Leo is at Buddy Anderson's. He has alibis, solid alibis from multiple people who now don't like him very much, don't really have an interest in lying to cover him. He's with them, but nobody sees Michelle. So at 12.43 a.m., Leo calls the sheriff looking for Michelle. It's been three hours since she told him she was coming to get him right away. Still no sign of her. Now, at 1.15 a.m., Leo leaves Vince's with his dad. And as they are leaving the house, you'd have to believe that they see Michelle driving up the road towards them. She's finally, after four hours, coming to get Leo. And Leo is fuming. He gets out of the truck and he gets in the car with Michelle. You can imagine the anger is spewing out of him. He screams at her in anger the whole way home, back to their trailer, while Leo Sr. goes along back to his own house. But one interesting thing about this is we know that Leo Jr. and Leo Sr. would have been together at this point. And when Leo's dad went to go pick up Leo, he thought he saw Michelle's car and actually honked his horn at it. And he, when he picked up Leo, Leo asked why he honked his horn. And Leo Jr., Leo Sr. said he thought he saw the orange Mazda. And you have to wonder, if Leo did this, is that sort of, we talk about this sometimes, the truth and the lie. Is that sort of his father's way of telling the story, which is a lie, but is somewhat accurate? That literally, but it wasn't before he picked up Leo, it was after and then as they're driving away, boom, they see the car, honk the horn, stop her, switcheroo happens. So that's 1.15. At 1.30, Alice Scott sees Leo and Michelle arrive at the trailer. They are arguing. Alice hears the sounds of fighting and ominous silence. And now is when it gets really interesting, so pay attention. That's at 1.30. At 1.50, according to Alice, Leo leaves the house and gets in the Mazda. He drives away. Let's say that the prosecution's theory is right. The only place you can really imagine him going at this point is to his father's house. So let's imagine he goes to his father's house. The trip to his father's house is nine miles. And at midnight, it would take him approximately 16 minutes to get from his trailer to his father's house. Let's assume he books it and he gets there in 10. That puts him there at 2 a.m. He then spends some amount of time telling his father that he's murdered Michelle and he needs his father's help. His father tells him to go back to the house, get Michelle's body, and come back. All of this had to have happened in a split second. There are no questions, nothing, no discussion about this. His father is just fully on board with covering this up with basically nothing. And assuming the same booking it speed, it would take him another two minutes to get back to the trailer. That puts him at 210. 
The problem is, according to Alice Scott, this whole trip happens in 20 minutes. So assuming he's booking it really going fast, it takes him 10 minutes to get to his father's house and 10 minutes to get back. That's all the time he has. At some point, he has to do the whole discussion thing with his father. And oh, by the way, there is a phone call at 2 o'clock where he uses the phone to call Michelle's aunt and see if she's seen her niece, presumably under this theory that happened at his father's house. But when? Where is the time that you would need for him to go from his house to his father's house, make the phone call, tell his father the story about what's happened, formulate a plan, and then go back to the house, to the trailer, in time to get there at 210? I don't think it's right to discount the lack of time to explain anything to his father. The reason he has to book it to his father's is that this was not a planned murder, right? That this was a heat of the moment thing. Otherwise, he wouldn't need to be booking it back and forth to his dad. If the plan all along was for him to get angry at her for being late that and they had no phone, so they, they had to you know depend on her lateness and they don't know what hour that's going to happen, he wouldn't need to go tell his father. His father would have been waiting somewhere, ready to help him without the booking it back and forth, especially if you want an alibi. And I think we all, the way that she was murdered, and even if you think Leo did it, it was a heat of the moment thing, not a pre-planned sort of thing. And so you are leaving zero time to explain, I just killed my wife, help me clean it up, no questions asked. That's a lot. That is a lot to fit into no time, even if it is your own father and you guys might be able to jive on lots of levels. That is a, a shocking amount of information to convey in no time in this timeline. So to do all this and get back at 210, we really have to cut that 16 minute drive down to something more like five minutes, which I guess means Leo's going like 120 miles an hour in this Mazda on these back roads at midnight. Maybe there's no traffic. Maybe he can really, really just, I mean, he's flying. So he arrives back at the house. He pulls up in front of the trailer. This is at 2.10. At 2.20, so 10 minutes after that, Alice Scott sees Leo carrying Michelle's body and putting it in the back of the car. Leo drives back to his father's house. His father takes the Mazda, and Leo takes the truck. This would, again, have taken around 10 minutes. At the absolute fastest, give him five if you think he's going something crazy. But we'll assume, just to make this timeline work, that this is five minutes, he's going 120 miles an hour, he's going as fast as he can. They quickly make the vehicle switch, and now he has to go to David Somm's house, who is Michelle's mother, because he has to get there by 2.30. That's right. At 2.20, Alice Scott sees Leo putting Michelle's body in the back of the car. At 2.30, Leo and his mother are at David Somm's house in the truck. Ten minutes later. In ten minutes, they would have had to have met, made the body swap, and gotten down to David Somm's house in order for this to work. The distance from his parents' house to David Somm's house is ten miles. And according to Google Maps, even at midnight, it would take 20 minutes to get there. If Leo is driving 120 miles an hour, he still wouldn't get there. This is an impossible distance. You have to figure out something else that doesn't quite fit with anything Alice Scott has said in order for him to do the things he has to do. How does he get from his house to meet up with his parents to David Somm's house in 10 minutes? At 2.45, Leo and his mother are talking to police officers to further bolster his alibi. At 3 o'clock... You would have to believe that Leo and his mother meet his father where the body is to be dumped. Leo gets out of the truck and chats with Leo Sr., trying to decide what to do. The LaFoons drive by and see them. For this to have happened, Leo Sr. would have had to know exactly where he was going to dump the body and already told Leo. Remember, they don't have cell phones, so they're not coordinating this real time. They would have had to have planned this ahead of time somehow. He also would have had to have hung around the area where he was going to dump the body a half an hour or more. If Leo's father has the body and he's the one driving the Mazda up to the dump site, he just gets there and sits there while Leo is talking to David Somm, while Leo is talking to the police. He just hangs out until Leo finally meets him there after he set up his alibi. They then go their separate ways. One of them drives away to dump the car, but it breaks down, so they end up leaving it on the side of the road and drive away, and then Leo is back at the Anderson's house by 440. All that has to have happened for the timeline to fit Leo having 
done this. Seems like an impossible timeline, but there it is. Yeah. There's the timeline. There is the timeline if you believe Alice Scott's testimony, and this is within the prosecution's theory of the case. In other words, I think this is a really tough one. It doesn't mean Leo couldn't have done it, but under this timeline, given the testimony that we have and given the prosecution's theory, this seems just about impossible. And I think what it means is you lose Alice Scott. Like if Leo did it, Alice Scott's either confused or just lying. And that means you leave, you lose a huge chunk of your evidence. One of your best witnesses is Alice Scott because she puts them together. She knows about the fighting. She's the one who says that Michelle screamed, no, Leo, don't. She's the one who testifies to Leo putting the body in the back of the car. Take all that away. You know, imagine all you have is the LaFoons. Imagine that's all you got. You got the LaFoons saying they see the two cars on the side of the road. Maybe that's still enough. But losing Alice Scott, as much as we've talked about Alice Scott's flaws, is a huge blow to this case. But you basically have to take Alice Scott out of this for this timeline to work. She herself is messing up the prosecution's case. And remember, her initial story, this was not her timeline. She shifts her timeline because her initial timeline doesn't work at all. So she has to push it back into a time where this works. But because of things we know happen, like the call to Michelle's aunt and the visit to David Psalm's house, there are things that are happening in the middle of this timeline that seem to make it impossible, just physically impossible by the laws of physics and the laws of time for Leo to have traveled the distances he would need to travel in order for this to work. And I think you put your finger on it. You know, we've talked a lot about how problematic Alice Scott is as a witness throughout this. And so if you got rid of her, then the timeline works a lot better. But that is exactly the problem. She is the star witness. She is the one who puts it all together. Because of all the problems we talked about, Leo Sr., there's no other kind of witnesses to see. There's not an Alice Scott and Leo Sr. story. That's why he's not as viable of a suspect as Leo Jr. But for Alice Scott... There isn't much evidence tying him for the prosecution's theory back in 1987. There's the LaFoons. The LaFoons, remember, came and talked to the police 15 months later with none other than Alice Scott. So with all of this said, there was obviously a trial in this case. You know, it wasn't Jeremy Scott who was charged. Back in 1987, it was Leo who was charged. He went to trial and he was convicted by a jury of 10, not 12, but he was convicted. So... With everything that was presented to the jury at the time, with what they knew at the presentation of the jury, not what we know today with advancements in, you know, databases, was there enough to convict Leo? And before we answer that, I do think there are some important things to note. You guys have traveled with us for the past eight episodes, and we've talked a lot about witnesses. We've poked holes into witnesses' stories, you know, what may have been the motivations or the misremembering of memories. We've talked about a lot more than was actually at trial. Obviously, in episode seven, last episode and today, we talked a lot about Jeremy Scott, who wasn't even a known entity during the trial. So Jeremy Scott, it was not an alternate suspect then at all. He wasn't brought up. His name wasn't known. It was truly the stranger theory, right? This was the theory that we talked about. It's always the throw spaghetti at the wall. It could be anyone but me. Can you think of another possibility? And we always say, well, it's not Occam's razor. There's absolutely no evidence for a stranger. So that kind of falls flat. So back during the presentation of the jury, you had no Jeremy Scott. Those fingerprints didn't come back to anyone. All we knew was that someone wiped it down and there were some errant fingerprints. And we've talked about this in other cases. Even when you wipe down, maybe you missed some fingerprints. Maybe someone did stop by and try to steal something. Maybe it was the mechanic's fingerprints and it's never matched back to anybody because you just didn't wipe all the areas because you can't see fingerprints. You just have to wipe, especially in the dark. So maybe those really meant nothing. And the fact that they didn't come back to Michelle or Leo, it's just kind of a throwaway evidence. There were a couple other things, too, that didn't really come out in trial that I think is important to note that we've talked a lot about. And one is Alice Scott. We've talked about Alice Scott a lot over these last eight episodes. We've talked about how her story has changed, that there seem to be parts of her testimony that are just impossible, that could not possibly have been the case, that it seems that she has an interest in inserting herself in places in the story that she could not have known whatsoever. She seems to be talking to other witnesses to get their stories to align as well. 
Here's the thing. This is basically what the jury heard from Alice Scott. Alice Scott lives next door to the guy who has been charged with the murder of Michelle, a violent murder. And she can testify that he has been violent, so violent to his wife as long as she's been living next door to him. She hears this day in and day out, beating, slapping, screaming, degrading from Leo to Michelle. And that adds on really nicely and is completely bolstered by the dozens of witnesses who testified before her for the prosecution talking about what a terrible husband and man Leo has been towards Michelle. And so you've heard all these stories about how violent Leo is towards Michelle. And then you have Alice Scott take the stand and basically tell the same story that everyone else has. And Other than the fact that it comes out during cross-examination that her story has changed a little, we told you this, witnesses' testimony change sometimes, not for any nefarious reason. They just might misremember things or remember things better as they really think about it and had time to think about it. But other than the fact that her testimony has changed, Edmonds didn't really dig into the fact that there were so many inconsistencies in her story, that she had such credibility issues, that she had her hands in the LaFoon's testimony, for example, in her sister-in-law's testimony. I mean, there are real, real problems with Alice Scott that were not presented whatsoever to the jury. So you as the jury, back during Leo's trial, would have heard her be corroborated with all the other witnesses that he's incredibly violent. Here's something that is like out of a movie. How can you disregard that she heard no, Leo, no? Michelle's last words, crying for her life. And then seeing him carry out something heavy when we know she's been dumped. Her body's not left at the trailer. I mean, these are, these are Hollywood moments for any sort of witness. And she is telling the story. And what we know is we have a dead young girl. She's a teenager. Snuffed from this earth much too early. And we want justice for her. And seemingly we're getting it on a silver platter with this witness who is next door sees everything, hears everything, and it seems quite compelling. Yeah, I would have absolutely convicted him. I would have voted guilty, and there's no question. And I actually think it's important that everybody accept that you would have too. If you were on that jury, and you heard what the prosecution presented, and you heard the defense case, not not the way we put it, not with our analysis and all our other let's stuff. Just, let's just be very clear. Truthfully, the last seven episodes is not what the defense put on. Even though we went through the trial testimony, there was not the cross-examination and the poking of holes into the credibilities of both the LaFoons and Alice Scott the way we have. Go back and read the cross-examination and the presentation of the defense. This is a situation where you have a man who is abusive. You have multiple witnesses who are testifying to that. You have no alternative theory whatsoever other than some other guy did it. You have a witness who not only basically heard the murder, but saw him carrying the body out. You have two witnesses who saw him at the dump site location with the car that belongs to his father. And oh, by the way, his father found the body. I mean, just based on that and with the defense that was presented, which didn't really do much of anything. I mean, did a good job, I think, of sort of undermining Alice Scott, but only if you really paid attention. I mean, that's the problem. Like, it was evident to me, reading the transcript, that... He was doing a good job, but honestly, he just, his whole defense was so incoherent that he never really brought it together. He never tied everything up. I think the vast majority of people, if they're on that jury, would have found him guilty and never would have thought twice about it and would have moved on and would have felt pretty confident in their verdict. Now, I think if you look at the evidence the way we did, even without Jeremy Scott, put Jeremy Scott aside, if you look at it the way we did, and you really sit down and you really think through the timeline and you walk through the evidence and you think about the lack of blood and everything else, then I think you can probably find reasonable doubt. But I think you would have needed a pretty good lawyer or a juror who was just really thoughtful and taking great notes and really had it together in like a 12 angry men situation where they went into there and they're the one not guilty vote and they just slowly convince everybody else that they're not guilty. I think you would have needed something like that. This is an area I completely disagree with Bone Valley on. Bone Valley presents it as if the judge should have acquitted him at the judgment of acquittal stage, that there wasn't even enough evidence to go to the jury. I disagree completely. But the problem with this case is it's based on eyewitnesses 
who we now know are incredibly questionable, a timeline that really doesn't work, no real physical evidence, and a lot of pretty prejudicial evidence that makes you want to convict Leo, even if he's not guilty. And we've seen this. We've seen people, as we've been covering this, who said things like, I don't care if he's guilty or not. If he did that to his wife, he's exactly where he needs to be. And if you're on the jury and you're thinking that way, you're not going to be open to a lot of opposing evidence. You're not going to be open to a lot of evidence that would possibly create doubt for you. And here's the other thing. You know, Jack Edmonds did a good job in cross-examining to undermine Alice Scott, but he did not point out the things that we've talked about, like the serious credibility issues. He basically points out that she had one story at one time and then had another story at another time, which a lot of witnesses had that story. But who cares? She heard the murder happen. And who cares? Because she's lived next to them and she's seen all this. And he doesn't dig into all of the problems with Alice Scott's testimony, as we've said. And also, we don't hear about the LaFoons. We know the jury heard that it came out 15 months later. But the police report of the LaFoons speaking with the police 15 months earlier, right after the murder, was not brought out during trial. That's a lot more powerful when you know that the LaFoons don't like Leo back when they're talking to the police in February or you know, right after the murder. And they're saying things like he's bragging about killing his wife at the bar, but they don't mention seeing the cars and Leo at the dump site at that time. It doesn't make any sense. And it absolutely undermines the credibility of their testimony, because I will tell you, take out Alice Scott, even if you think she has problems when you're watching her testify, which I, I actually don't think you have as many problems with her testimony as you do after listening to these eight episodes. The LaFoons, though, seem credible, right? They seem to have no bone to pick whatsoever, and they see something that is so damning for Leo. But when you read that police report from right after the murder, when they speak to the police, and they are like anti-Leo, they are not Team Leo at that point, they would love to have been able to say they saw Leo at the dump site. They were saying he's bragging about killing his wife, yet they don't go that extra step to say, and we saw him at the dump site. It makes no sense. It makes no sense in the sense that I don't think they really saw that at the time. They may have really believed it 15 months later because time has passed. They talked to Alice Scott. They've been badgered with what they may or may not have remembered. But they had every interest and every kind of bias against Leo at that time to say that they saw him at the dump site if they actually saw him. Yet 15 months passed by before they brought up the fact that they see him there, which I think is a very bad fact for Leo at trial. So all the jury heard then was these independent people, you know, not neighbors, don't know anything about him, saw him at the dump site. How do you reconcile that? Then you have a neighbor who hears the murder happening and a separate couple, two people, not just one eyewitness, but two eyewitnesses who see Leo at the dump site. Yeah, I would have voted to convict. I absolutely would have. And I think this case, in my mind, is a great example of something we talk about a lot. Because there was one person who was in a position to see all the problems with this case, and it's the prosecutor. I think John Aguero, I think that conversation with Leo happened, whether Leo's guilty or not. I think John Aguero went to the prison and told him, I really think it's your dad, testify against your dad, and we won't go forward. Or, I'm going to put you in the chair, basically. And it's hard to overstate how unethical, inappropriate, and wrong it was to do that if he did that. But I also think it speaks to his own doubt about the case. I think he was familiar enough with the case and familiar enough with Alice Scott and familiar enough with all the holes that he recognized this was a case with serious problems. And he recognized that, I mean, maybe he believed, I'm not sure how it went down. I just think it was one of them. And, the, and as Alice said, if it was one of them, the other one was probably involved. So whatever, six of, six of one, half a dozen of the other. I'd rather get the father who I think really did it. But if I get Leo who helped, fine. That is, that's not how you're supposed to do justice. I mean, that's not, that's not what you're supposed to do. And I think Aguero, I think it had been a while. Remember, as we said, it wasn't Michelle was killed and two weeks later, Leo was arrested and taken to court. I mean, this took a while. This took over a year. I think Aguero was desperate. I think he wanted to pin this on Leo. I think he truly believed in his heart and just in the depths of his soul that Leo and his father were responsible for this. And so he stopped being that initial safeguard he's supposed to be and not bring a case that has these massive holes because we love juries. 
juries are great, but juries are just ordinary people, and sometimes they miss all those holes, particularly if there's not a good defense attorney pointing it out. Would Leo have been acquitted with the public defender? I don't know, but they would have done a much better job. They would have gotten down to a lot of the stuff we talked about in these episodes. And not just that, but... No, it took us eight episodes to get to the timeline we just did. So we've done a lot of timelines in this case. But this timeline we just did of if Leo did it and kind of the having to go 120 miles per hour, the cutting down the drive time that should have been 16 minutes to five minutes, the having, you know, 20 seconds to explain to us, father, killed Michelle, help me cover it up. No questions. Get in the car. We're driving 120 miles. None of that was presented to the jury. And that took a long time, by the way, to put that timeline together. Maybe a juror could have picked all that up. But it's not presented in that way. The way a trial works is that no one witness knows an entire timeline. You guys know this. We've put this timeline together after examining the entire trial record for essentially six plus episodes before we put this timeline together. So no one person in almost any case, certainly not a complex murder case, gets on the stand and is able to tell you the timeline from A to Z. Rather, you get holes from the testimonies. So one witness might give you A and K. And then a second witness gives you C and Z. And this goes on for many, many weeks. And that's why you have closing arguments at the end, because that whole timeline is what you should hear in a closing argument by the defense. That wasn't ever presented. There was no aha moment for the jurors to think, could he have driven 120 miles per hour? Maybe, but did he? like eight times in a row so that he could make it back in time to fit into the timeline seems really unlikely. They weren't even posed that question of whether the timeline could have worked. And I think when you put the timeline out like that, it's really hard to make that timeline work. So that's the question of what would we have done if we'd been on the jury? And I, and I think all of you out there just should take a moment and think about it because it's so easy sitting where we are today to say things like, well, I never would have done that. But I think when you do that, you don't learn a lot about sort of the, your own way of looking at things and it doesn't really help you avoid problems in the future. And I think it's worth it in cases like this where potentially something really bad happened and really wrong happened to put yourself in the shoes of the people who made those decisions and recognize why they made the decisions they did and decide how you would handle that then and how you would handle it now. But that's the question of what we would do. The bigger question, and I think the more important question, is Leo guilty of this case or not? And I think that brings us to where we often arrive, which is what would you have to believe to believe that Leo is guilty? Okay. Let's get back to Leo, because we just told you that you likely and we would have convicted if we heard what the jury heard based on the prosecution, based on the witnesses and based on, more importantly, what the defense presented there. But that's a separate question from did Leo do it? Let's talk about what you'd have to believe for Leo to be guilty. Now, this is based on all the timeline that we've talked about. Okay. So after Michelle stopped to call Leo and tell him she was coming to get him, she inexplicably just didn't get him. Then for nearly four hours, she disappeared. She wasn't with her friends. None of them saw Michelle that night. So if she was just hanging around for four hours and intentionally not picking up Leo, then maybe she was with a stranger. However, there's been no one who's ever come forward. All right. Well, I know we said we were going to do this in eight episodes, but you know what? I lied to you guys. I'm sorry. You blame me. Don't blame Alice. It's all my fault. But to keep this from going long, we're going to go ahead and cut this off now. But because we love you, we will be back tomorrow with another episode, with our ninth episode on the case, where we will lay out for you our theories, what we think happened, and why we think it happened. So there is so much left to discuss. So much. It's going to take one more episode to do it. Well, Alice, do you want to answer questions before we sign off? I think the least we can do, because we didn't fit it all into eight episodes, is to answer some questions. Let's answer some questions. Remember, guys, if you leave a five-star review on Apple and leave a question, we will get to your question eventually, even if you leave a really complicated legal question, which is what some of you do. So this is an interesting one. We don't actually, we've never looked at this case beyond making fun of this person a lot, but, well, I'll ask the question anyway, because it's, it's a sort of a global question, but just know that when we answer this question, we don't know enough about the specifics to know just how bad it was, but we'll give you sort of our general experience. So this is from Hall Mo. 
Halmo wants to know, what are y'all's thoughts on the former assistant United States attorney, Kevin Fildus, and his involvement in the interviews with Israel Keys? Some say he botched it with his direct involvement. And so for those of you who don't know, when Israel Keys was arrested and interrogated by the FBI, there was an assistant United States attorney who was there as well, who also asked questions. So I think that's essentially, we can, I don't know what questions he asked. Maybe he did botch it, but we can approach it from sort of our experience with those types of things. Alice, is it unusual for a prosecutor to be in the room when a subject is interviewed? No. No, it isn't. I mean, we talked about this a lot. A prosecutor doesn't have to be in the room, but oftentimes when we are investigating kind of more complex cases, we want to be there so that we make sure all the questions we want asked are asked. And we don't ever do it alone. We've talked about this in the Schofield episodes. Always have an agent there with us because we don't want to be the fact witnesses, right? We want the agent to be the one who has to testify. So no, this, I mean... Brett, like such a big percentage of our day while investigating cases is actually going with agents to interview subjects, targets, witnesses. And you have to, I do think you have to respect the fact that your agents, your officers, your investigators, they are trained in interview techniques and they're really good at it. And it's not that we're in every interview that happens. There are certainly interviews, particularly when there's sort of a cover story that's being used. We obviously wouldn't be there for that, but a lot of times we are in there and you just have to, you have to be respectful of them and not take over and not ask every question. But like Alice said, we have a different perspective than the agents do. We know more about what we need from the person than they may. So it's not that unusual to have people, multiple people, and it can be agents from different agencies or different law enforcement groups. I mean, it, it can be all sorts of different things. And you just, you have to take it case by case, I think. So maybe they mess it up in that case. I don't know. You know, maybe one day we'll look at that case. Yeah, you could you could mess it up once you're in there. But the fact of being there itself is not actually that extraordinary. Okay, this is from Candy Mandy 86 We'll answer this one and then we'll go ahead and sign off. Candy Mandy wants to know, what cases do each of you, and then they put in parentheses, Alice and Brett, so, just in case we were confused, like solved, unsolved, government conspiracies, missing people, paranormal, or mysterious supernatural. That was quite the list. I think I know what yours are. Yeah, I mean, mine are really sort of unsolved mysteries. I love unsolved mysteries. That's why I like disappearances so much, because they're more mysterious. That's why I do love pass is fascinating to me. I, I like that. That's That was really my gateway into true crime was sort of mysterious happenings that we don't really know exactly what happened. So those are my favorite kind of cases. That's why we do a lot of them. Some people hate disappearances. We get that criticism sometimes that we do too many disappearances. Well, we're not going to stop because that to me is the most fascinating of the true crime. And, and a lot of people like solved cases. We do solve cases every now and then because some of y'all love them. Solved cases are boring to me. Usually I'm like, it's just lacking that extra level of mystery. Yeah, I agree, except maybe slightly differently. I hate when it's unsolved in my mind, though, because I want to understand and I want to, I mean, I think you can tell by the way that I think through cases, I want to understand and put myself in the shoes of everything that's happening and make sense of the situation in a way that makes sense of the world that this situation is happening in. And I like the freedom I have in an unsolved case to do that, but I get very frustrated when I come out of the case and I'm like, I have no idea. I, I, I like the yeah, love pass. I know you love it. It, I hate it because I don't know what happened, <laughs> you know? And I'll say this. I still buy books, the yeah, love pass books when they come out. But the bad thing about this podcast is it's really taken some of the joy out of my life because used to like, if there was a YouTube video on the yeah, love pass, I would watch it. Now one comes up, I'm like, I'm not gonna waste my time. We did seven episodes or whatever on that. Whatever this person is going to say, it's not going to add anything to this. So that's one downside of the podcast is a lot of times some of the mysteries, when we look into them, turns out maybe they're not so mysterious. Like the lighthouse is a good example of that. They used to be one. I would watch everything about the lighthouse keepers, but then we did it. And it's like, no, I see. And I think that's fair. I think you guys know that I don't like paranormal things. I don't like creepy, you know, scary things. And I think the fact that when I really dive into these cases and can make sense of them 
they are no longer the paranormal to me, right? Like I, I can make sense of it, even if it's horrific and it's like, you know, the most depraved of human nature and it's very sad, but understanding what creates these horrible, you know, depraved situations helps me make sense of the world. And then it no longer is the paranormal for me. All right. Well, I hope you guys enjoyed that. Come back tomorrow. We'll finish up this case. We know you've got lots of thoughts and theories at Prosecutors Pod for all your social media. Join us on TikTok. We're TikToking now. Alice, find us there. Enjoy it. We ticky talky. We, tiki we do things like read our bad reviews. Alice is particularly enjoying that, I think. So it's so fun. So fun. People are so, so mean, mean, guys, <laughs> and they're so mean to me. Yeah, it's true. But you know, we enjoy it anyway. So join us there. Join us in the gallery. Those of you on Patreon, by the way. People complain about the Patreon app all the time. I'm trying to make it more intuitive. So I'm creating these collections where you can find the lives and you can find the published episodes. So if you're having trouble finding stuff, maybe try the collections. That may be one way to do it. And remember, there's an RSS feed. So you can always take the RSS feed, put it into your favorite podcast player, and the finished episodes will download for you automatically. So check that out. And hopefully you guys enjoy that all right alice we'll be back next week actually no we'll be back tomorrow but until then i'm brett and i'm alice and we are the prosecutors If you think you will, by the way, you can make a lot of money because there's a bet on it and it's like plus 2200 is no or is yes. So if you think he's going to, if you think he's going to propose, you can bet a hundred dollars and win $2,200. So if you think he's going to propose, put your money where your mouth is and make it happen. I, see, here's the thing. I think it would be the, just the most amazing media opportunity ever. So I think he totally should. Can I just can I just say something of the difference between I'll just say you and me, but men and women. I think guys think that's so romantic to propose at the Super Bowl, but I'd be like, this is the most important day of my life. Like, we're not sharing it with the Super Bowl. <laughs> I don't think it's romantic. I think it's a great media opportunity, and she is she commands. Uh-uh. Pluto TV is TV the way it should be, free, with over 300 channels, thousands of movies and TV shows, costing zeros of dollars. So if you want to watch shows like Ghost, The Walking Dead, CSI, Star Trek, or The Price is Right, well, The Price is Right, it's free. Hit movies like Braveheart, Sonic the Hedgehog, Anchorman, The Legend of Ron Burgundy, or Mean Girls won't cost you a thing, because everything is free. All you have to do is download the app, which, by the way, is also free. Pluto TV. Stream now, pay never.